We give thanks to God for bringing us again to resume this teaching. Uh, it's been quite a while, but we needed to give time and attention to other areas of ministry. Of course, this has not been far from our minds, and it's a joy to be able to return as we move into First Peter chapter 4. Let's turn to God in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we thank you that your word remains living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. As you have helped us in the past, so help us yet again to discover the treasures in your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So thank you for being able to uh, give this time to our further teaching. We're still on First Peter. It's not a book that you can hurry over because even though it's a short book, so much has been compacted in it, so many great truths. And we don't want to miss anything in the uh, process of hurrying over it. I do hope that you are feeling blessed and that whenever you pick up the book, First Peter, you are reading it with a new um, mindset and new understanding. Now, let's look at First Peter chapter 4. Verses 1 to 6. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of, his, of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we get into chapter 4, even though there is this chapter division, it is a thought that flows from the end of chapter 3, where we were told that Christ suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And of course, you recall that we looked at those um, very difficult uh, um, aspects of that passage when Peter talked about those who did not believe and talked about the spirits in prison uh, during the days of uh, Noah's building of the ark. When we continue in that thought and that is what brings us again to the example, the supreme example of the suffering of Christ. It comes in as it has come in earlier in this book because that is a truth that no Christian who values his salvation and who understands what it meant to be redeemed by the blood of Christ, it is something we cannot and should never forget. It is the greatest truth about our transformation. Now Peter tells his readers to take inspiration from that example of Christ's suffering and he does so in very unusual ways. Unusual because if you and I were to um, address the same issue, we would most likely do it differently. And 
Our topic for today is the Christian's armor. The Christian's armor. That is the weapon that the Christian uses for spiritual warfare. These uh, weapons are mentioned in different ways in different parts of scripture. But let's see what Peter has to say to us here. Recall that verse 1 of this chapter says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Now the word arm is a military word, a security word. So when you are told arm yourself, it means that there is danger around you and you should protect yourself. You should get ready to defend yourself or indeed to attack the enemy that is advancing. And here was a situation of hostility that the Christians were living in. And what exactly did Peter mean by asking them to arm themselves? Of course, he says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, that is, as Christ. That is, take the lifestyle of Christ Jesus. Of course, when one sees Peter saying, arm yourselves, and saying that to Christians living in a hostile environment, one would expect that he's going to mention some of the well-known weapons of the day, like swords, or probably spears, or shield. But what we hear takes us by surprise. He says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. How do you tell somebody to arm himself or herself by thinking in a particular way? You know, this is the kind of surprise we find when God told Joshua in the Old Testament, a man whom God had said should lead the Israelites into the promised land, and it was going to involve battles. He would fight. Now, you would expect God would tell him, this is the kind of weapon you should go with. But the surprise is in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, when God actually tells Joshua, this book of the Lord shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. You shall have great success. So, you know, it, it just makes you say, does God understand what is involved in this battle we are going into? How can a military general be going into battle and you tell him to read his Bible? And that's the way we feel when we read what Peter is saying. This must mean, therefore, that since God knows all things and God cannot be wrong, what God means by weapons has a much higher and superior meaning to what you and I think of weapons. For instance, in the New Testament, following this same thought and perspective, both Jesus and the New Testament apostles tell us some things about the Christian's armor, how to fight spiritual battles. And we do need to remind ourselves of this in our day and time because we are sliding away from some of those um, uh, thoughts and teachings that the Lord and the disciples gave to us, even though they lived in days that were as difficult as ours are. For instance, they taught, the Lord taught and his disciples followed that we should love our enemies, we should turn the other cheek and not repay evil for evil. Now let's see how Apostle Paul said it, this unusual mindset. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power 
to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And then he still tells the Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. That is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. So let us see what the mind of Christ really involves. Because you see, what we've just looked at are what we may call the strange armor of the Christian. Now, what is the mind of Christ as we look at this armor that um, Peter says they should arm themselves with? The armor that Peter recommends is none other than the mind of Christ. And what he means by saying, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking is what we must understand. Again, let us listen to apostolic witness in all of this. Peter had said earlier in chapter 2 verse 11, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. In that same chapter he said in verses 21 to 23, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The same Paul um, who had spoken to us earlier as we read uh, Corinthians and also uh, Ephesians, now comes in again in his letter to the Philippians, this time chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now Christians should seek the mind of Christ through the word of God. That kind of mindset is unnatural to this world in which we live, and it is unnatural to human nature. And that is why the Christian life has to be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, you see, if we try to live it by mere willpower, we will lose out and we run out of steam. When he says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, as he does in verse 1, that is Peter, uh, in this chapter 4, that must mean that the suffering of Christ for our atonement has dealt with the problem of sinful humanity. While the Christian believer is not immediately catapulted into a life of sinless perfection once he becomes a Christian, we must understand that that life means 
that the Christian no longer lives under the dominion and the power of sin, practicing sin as a helpless captive, for he now has a savior in Jesus Christ. Indeed, 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. One thing I have found helpful in understanding some of the struggles that still continue long after one has become a believer is the three parts of our salvation. A Christian is saved, yes, but there are aspects that belong to the past and to the present and to the future. For the past, he has been saved from the penalty of sin. He who believes in Jesus has passed from death to life. There is now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the present, he is saved, the Christian is saved from the um, power of sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. But not only is the Christian saved from the penalty and power of sin, but in the future to come, in eternity when we are with Christ, the Christian will be saved from the very presence of sin. Nothing that defiles shall be found in heaven. And so when we don't understand that in this world where we are now, even though we've been saved from the penalty of sin, we still live with the reality and the presence of sin. You will see people saying all sorts of things. Yes, sin shall not have dominion over us as though we were under the authority of sin because the power of the Holy Spirit in us helps us to overcome sin from victory to victory. Yet, there is a future to look forward to when everything that causes sin will be forever removed. Furthermore, what Peter is analyzing here is similar to what baptism symbolizes, and this is beautifully brought out in Romans chapter 6. And our old life is buried with Christ in his death, and the same life that is now committed to Christ is raised with Jesus in newness, just as Christ was raised to eternal life above the powers of this fallen world, never more to die. As Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 14, Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That is Romans chapter 6 verses 11 to 14. Peter tells them how our union with Christ in baptism divides our life, as I said earlier, into past, present, and future. For the past, Peter tells them, it was a time when people did what they liked in unrestrained sinfulness. He says, for the time that is past, suffices for doing what the Gentiles, that is unbelievers, want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. In those days, and in that setting to which Peter was writing where these believers were, the most common ways of indulgence by the unbelievers who are called Gentiles were unedifying games such as the gladiatorial fights, 
where blood was spilled and people felt entertained by others who were being wounded or killed. Another preoccupation of that old life was sex outside marriage or even within marriage, um, simply just free sex whenever the urge came. And slander and drinking and theft and things that definitely you could not say this is a life that honors God. Now the Christian believer who has made a crossover to this new life by faith in Christ gives himself to a new way of living for the rest of his or her life. So as to live, that's what verse 2 says, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. No longer for human passions, as it was in the past, but henceforth for the will of God. Every new believer knows that a time comes when they have to choose between their old way of living and their old friends and the new way of living and indeed the new friends. There has to be a crossover. There has to be a separation. And this new life with its new compatible values must be different from what the old life was. The third thing we are going to look at in this short passage, therefore, is that the future judgment is sure. We have talked about the strange weapon of the Christian, and we have also looked about developing the mind of Christ. Finally, let us look at the fact that future judgment is sure. In verse 4, Peter says, with respect to this, they, that is, your unbelieving friends, your old friends with whom you did all kinds of things before, without being conscious of God, he says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. So two things. One, they are surprised that you no longer join them. Well, we're doing this thing together now. Haba, what has come? Were we not going to church? Did it change anything? And then when you no longer join them in doing the same things, because there's a new law, a new nature, a new power in your life, they're surprised. But they don't stop at that. They become angry and offended. And they begin to malign you. In fact, some of them hate you. They say you are a killjoy. We don't know what has come over you. And those who are your close friends will easily, easily become your enemies. But if you are going through that right now, know that the friends you have lost can never compare with the friend you have gained in Christ and the friends that Christ will give to you. The preaching of the gospel, well, uh, verse 5 says, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So, yes, they may malign you. But when that is happening, God is not folding his arms. God will do something. He will call them to account. And that's what verse 5 says. They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The preaching of the gospel gives an opportunity for us to make decisions for the Lord. And for all others to make decisions for Jesus Christ. When at the last day men and women stand condemned before the judgment throne of God, it will not be because they did not hear the gospel, but rather because they heard it and made a choice to reject it and to reject the offer that God gave in Christ. God said, it does not matter how sinful you are. If you will come to Christ, those sins have been paid for, you will be forgiven. 
But you see, some people see this offer of God and they treat it as though it were a joke or as if it's not important. And as C.S. Lewis has said, that there are two categories of humanity in life. Those who say to God, all through their lives, thy will be done. And those who chose to disregard God, to whom God will say, at the end of time, thy will be done. That's what you've chosen, so what you've chosen is the consequence that follows. There is no time for a change of mind at that point. And this is important. The preaching of the gospel is the key to life eternal. And verse 6 says, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Well, this places a challenge before the church and before believers, Christians who know they have a relationship with God and are going to heaven. You see, we have unbelieving friends, unbelieving family members, and we have a responsibility to them. This is what Paul says about that. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, 14, 15. And then he asks, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in, on him, rather in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Romans 10, 13 to 15. We must remember that the battle is not over. So long as we are in this life, the battle to live with the mindset of Christ remains. And this is no time to rest. May God keep us strong unto the end by his grace. We're going to pray now and then we'll also sing a song, we'll play a song for you that tells us that the battle is not over. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that has come to us. Thank you for those who know you. Please keep us on the victory path. Arming ourselves with the mind of Christ. For those who do not know you, please, Lord, let them see the opportunity offered through the gospel. And for all of us, help us to know that the battle isn't over. Lead us, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Take this time, if you are not sure that you've made a commitment to Christ, you can say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in right now. Come in today. Come in to stay. And when you do make a break with the past, put your hands in the hands of the Master and He will lead you on.